Fire Radio. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the National Fire Radio podcast. Today, Deputy Chief Bill Parrott out of the Hartsdale Fire Department in New York. Chief, thanks for joining me, man. Hey, thanks so much for having me. Oh, this Excited is cool. 27 years in the fire service. You and I met a few weeks back up in Stanford, Connecticut, at an event uh, that uh, Mike Dragonetti and his crew uh, was putting on in Connecticut. And uh, a mutual friend grabbed me and said, hey, you got to meet this guy, uh, and so on. And so we, uh, we started talking from there. And um, yes, the nice thing about the podcast is I have the ability to offer – this to anyone, meaning I get to talk to people. And that's one of my favorite things because I don't know much about Hartsdale, that, that Westchester County area. I'm, I'm excited to learn a little bit about it today. Um, but that's what this podcast is all about. It's like not knowing where this conversation is going to go, interviewing complete strangers to the very best of friends. And so, Chief, I welcome you to the show today. Um, I'd love to Thank just you. break this down a little bit. Look, give me a little bit of background about you. I know you said 27 years in the fire service now. Um, maybe uh, go back to your roots and, and take me up through where we are today. Okay, yeah. I, I grew up in the Bronx and uh, lived around the corner from a busy firehouse, uh, 7937, and always saw them in the community, you know, at Seatown, the supermarket, and they're always happy group of guys. And in our community and you know, on our neighborhood growing up, we looked up to the fire department. And it was always a job I was interested in and moved up when I was 17 to uh, Pleasantville, which is like northern Westchester, you know, a little bit further up. Joined the volunteers right away. I didn't know I could join. You know, I was so excited. I was in a local pizzeria that a flyer up. I said, wow, I can join the fire department. Great. So joined yeah. the fire department. It was kind of on the road from there. And uh, was been in the volunteers starting in 97 and then uh, came on the job in 2002. You know, what, all the what was it from those early days in the Bronx as a kid? What was it about the firehouse, about the community? And like, what was it? What, what was it? The, the noise, the guys, the hanging out on the apron? Like, what was it? Uh, you know, I wasn't a kid that hung out at the firehouse. You know, if people see right. me now, they're going, you must have been over at the firehouse all the time. I really did, and I'd see them around the community. I think what we knew them to be, which I really love about the job, is they're reliable. Mm. And there was just a sense of reliability. Like, you know what? You call the fire department. They're going to come. They're going to fix your problem. You know, we talk a lot. Firefighters are professional problem solvers, right? And you just – that was drummed into our heads. They were trustworthy. They were reliable. And they looked happy, you know. You'd see them picking up the meal, you know, what I know now that I'm picking up the meal. Or right. they'd be, you know, out on BI or something like that. And they're just a happy group of guys. So reliable, trustworthy, and they love what they did. So it, it appealed to me. I think, I think that's something, that crew integrity, the way guys get along with one another, the way they joke around in public, the way they talk to the public. I think all that matters. And, and those are those informal things that, like, we don't know can influence somebody. Like, those guys from that firehouse influenced you and your career because of the way they conducted and carried out business. Definitely. I mean, the, you know, the, you can think about it. They set the trajectory for the rest of my life, you know. I mean, just based on my interaction with them kind of casually in the, you know, in our neighborhood. And, uh, you know, some of the guys lived in our neighborhood and, uh, you know, had kids in the neighborhood and stuff. So it just seemed like a great way to live your life, helping people out and having fun doing it. Do you think that matters? Do you think that living in the community that you serve, I'm not saying that it needs to be because it's practically impossible for most people these days to, yeah, to live where they work, especially in a lot of these, you know, more white collar communities where, or even in New York, listen, even New York City, I mean, they require residency oh, or the surrounding, you know, the surrounding counties, but to be able to afford a property there, to raise a family there, it's, it's very hard. And I know in your community, I'm sure that's rather hard too. Oh, it's very challenging. I mean, I think there's a, like you said, I don't think it's a mandatory type thing, but I think there's definitely a strength in it Yeah. because you have connection. Even something simple as you know the streets, you know, you, you know, you know the, the beat of how the community works and who's who. And I think it's a definite strength, you know, with connection. I don't think you can't overcome it, though, you know, if you're, if you're not right. from there. It just right. takes more work. You have to identify it and say, you know, I mean, we're a community-based organization. That's the fire department, right? All firefighting is local. So we have to and mesh ourselves, whatever it takes, whether we're from there or whether if we're not from there, we have to find ways to connect, you know, so. Well, I would agree. I would agree 100%. I think if you're there, you're automatically rooted. Your kids go through the school systems. You know people, yeah. you know neighbors, you become rooted. But if you're not there and you're only there for volunteering or from the paid side, you know, as a job, as a career, it takes work to become rooted. The fire department has to work hard at becoming a fixture within the community and to be trusted like that. Yeah, you have to cultivate it, you know, whether it's fire prevention details or just something simple, leaving the apparatus doors open. 
You know, don't be closed off. You know, taking the time to talk to people and when they ask you a question, stop, give them a good answer, you know, and, and think about it, be thoughtful, you know. Um, and that allows us to be connected, which I think also helps us do our job better. Yeah. To be honest with you. Yeah. And that influence you had then as a kid carries on to you moved up what they call upstate, right? Even though it's yeah, not even I mean, upstate. Anything <laughs> north of Yonkers in the Bronx was upstate. You know, I was yeah. like going to Ohio or something like that. Right. You know? My friends didn't know where I was. Right. But uh, yeah, and it was great. You know, I loved it. Uh, uh, the suburban America was really awesome. You know, coming out of the Bronx, which was really, you know, busy uh, area. It was nice to come somewhere where, you know, walk down the streets. It was like uh, something out of a sitcom, you know. Yeah, it was, it was great. And then the influence of that fire department there. I mean, once you found out you were able to join, right? So volunteer, right? Yeah. So we jumped right in and it allowed me to learn my community here. Like I made all my friends, uh, you know, coming in at 17 years old. It was a tough time to try to meet people, you know, cold. You know, everybody else is a small town. They've known each oh, other. Oh, yeah. Their lives. Well, yeah, right. So the, joining the fire department, it was a great introduction. And, uh, you know, back then it was a little more blue collar. So you had a lot of the DPW guys, the local cops, you had a couple of city firefighters and then, you know, some white collar workers and stuff like that too. So it was a nice mix and they were great at mentoring, uh, you know, take you under their wing. I joined the engine company, which was, there was four, it was a company based, you know, volunteer department. So I initially joined the engine company and, uh, got into engine work and that's kind of stayed my focus throughout my career. I run, you know, you know, I've been exposed to other aspects of it, but that's still my, my, my true love, you know, is the engine work. So, Well, I, we're going to go down that road. That's exciting. Um, that's pretty cool. So it, it, you went off to college, right? Yeah. And then, yeah. but the firehouse kept pulling you back. Yeah, I mean, I was, I went up to Holy Cross up in Worcester, Massachusetts, and, uh, you know, loved it up there. And, uh, but I just, you know, a lot of my friends were going into the, you know, business world, white collar world, you know, going to law school and stuff. And just that drive to go back to the fire department, you know, my Holy Cross had a, a motto, uh, men and women for others. And mm. so did my high school Ford and prep, you know, oh, okay. oh, Ford? thing it was, yeah. you know, over and over, right. Men and women for others. Sure. And as corny as it sounds, it just, it resonated, you know, and I just wanted to get back and do something where I felt like I was helping people. And, uh, you know, I was up there in 99 when the Worcester cold storage fire yeah. happened and we could see it from campus, you know, sure. and just watching the community, uh, the connection with the fire department, the dedication of those guys, God bless them. Uh, it, it was, it just, I, I don't know. That was a big focusing event, I think for me, where I just was like, wow, you know, this is something I really want to be a part of. It's, it's a meaningful way to live your life. It's an important way to be. And, uh, you know, it inspired me. So I just, I kept taking all the tests throughout college and started getting called like my senior year by different police and fire departments. Uh, police as well. So I did the same. Yeah. I was a criminal justice yeah. major, so I kind of did the same okay. thing. Um, yeah, and gotta, and had, oppor thing. had opportunities along the way in a lot of different ways, but uh, stayed with the family business. But my, I guess what I think is really cool, though, about this is that this is where the, the value of a volunteer fire service, a community-rooted organization like that, where you kind of fall in love with it, right? Like you, you, you join looking to belong and to serve. And then along that, along that journey as a 16, 18, 20 year old kid, you start to find this unconditional passion for it. And I think those are the guys that always tend to come back to it. They go off to college or they pursue something else, but they had that foundation from early on that kind of calls them back to it. And a lot of, I think that's where a lot of guys become career firemen from that experience. Absolutely. Um, you know, I think back about like fire service memories and, you know, you have ups and downs in the fire service experience you know, in your career. But some of my fondest memories would be like coming home from college and going out on a drill night and, you know, hooking a hydrant, flowing some water, learning from the senior guys, coming back, hanging out in the firehouse. And it's just the camaraderie of it coupled with the fact like you're learning skills and you're getting better and you're feeling the improvement. And, uh, it's just, it's, it just, I fell in love with it. You know, just, it was the best time. And so that was it. It's testing time. I want to get, I want to get on this job. I want to do it more than volunteer. And so you pursued yeah. it and uh, took a bunch of, I know you said you tested uh, quite many tests, right? Yep. I took all the police, all the fire department tests. Um, you know, my mom was always very supportive and was, you know, in civil service herself. So she told me, you know, send out, uh, letters to all the civil service agencies in the area and have them mail you applications, send them a self-addressed envelope with a stamp, yeah. and they would do that. So I would get all the applications, and as quickly as I'd get them, I'd file for them. And, uh, you know, I got called by a couple police departments, and then I got called first by the Scarsdale Fire Department in August of 2002. 
And uh, then later by the FDNY while well, I was in Proby School, but I stayed up in Westchester. Um, I kind of, you know, to be honest with you, I liked, I was just getting into Westchester. I yeah. liked the small town feel, and I just, I was excited to serve in Westchester. So, you know, that's where I uh, wound up setting up my career. Well, and Westchester is kind of unique, right? So if you break it down for me a little bit, I know it's a, it's a heavily populated county north of New York City, north of Yonkers. Um, and it offers a lot of different fire departments, and they're all of smaller size, right? Career, yeah, volunteer, West- combination. Yep. Um, I work on the side as a Westchester County fire instructor, so I get to teach career and volunteer. So I have you know interaction with all departments. There's uh, 58, I believe, departments in Westchester County. Okay. Uh, there's like 13, 14 career uh, departments. Of those, four of them are cities. Uh, you know, Yonkers, New Rochelle, Mount Vernon, White Plains, and then you have kind of the middle. Size departments, the Greenberg departments, you know, Hartsdale, where I work, right. Scarsdale, East Chester. Then you have some smaller career departments, like a large mine or something like that, and then everything else is volunteer. Um, so it's about a million residents in Westchester County. So you have everything from farms to high rise. You know, yeah, and, quite and, diverse. Yeah, it really is. So. so Scarsdale, I mean, that was your first hook. You got in, yeah. and uh, yeah. was it what you was it everything you wanted? It, it was great. It yeah. was great. Um, I had. In college, all my friends were getting summer internships. So I started calling around career fire departments, seeing if they had an internship. And then everybody was kind of like, hey, sorry, kid, you know, we don't do that. And uh, Scarsdale Fire Department, Captain Mike Byrne was like, actually, we have a village internship program and we can pay you and you can come and work with the training office and help out. And I was like, all right, great. And I started doing that. And what an awesome, awesome group of guys. You know, it was kind of a a more senior job when I was there. 47 career guys. It's a combination department. They have volunteers as well. Right. Uh, 47 career members, three firehouses. And uh, they just, well, they treated me like their little brother or their son, you know. And, and I did two summers interning, you know, there and helping out in the train office and going to the drills. They let me ride and everything like that. And it was great. It just, great summers. And I when I scored high enough on the list, the guys kind of advocated for me. They were like, hey, we got a couple spots opening up. I think you're nice. up on the list. And, yeah. And uh, they helped me out. Yeah, is that where your fa- I mean, you said you're an, you're a county instructor. Is that where you think your roots started with the training division? To, to think that that influenced you in that regard? You know, definitely. I think that I saw the impact and how foundational training is to the rest of the job. You know, I mean, training is the job. You know, people's like, well, I don't really like training, but training is the job. You yeah. know, that's the job function. So I really got to see that that that's the bedrock of it. And um, I always loved reading fire engineering, and you know, as as a kid when I first got in, and I just. I don't think there's enough hours in the day to get better at your job. You know, there's so much to know. And as quickly as you know one thing, you forget you forget it, and it's constant maintenance of skills. So I think training is essential, and that's why I love it. I just love being a part of that. Yeah, and so I want to – we'll circle back to that when we get to your current department and where you are in the position you're in now. Mm-hmm. So from Scarsdale then, a um, couple of years there, spent some time there. Yep. Learned yep, a job, learned, learned the craft a little bit more. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, mostly a private dwelling. Uh, they do a lot of private dwelling fires and uh, extrications. That's like their two big things. I remember my senior man telling me, like, hey, kid, we do house fires and we cut people out of cars. That's the two big things we do here. Doesn't so, sound so bad, though. Yeah. And, uh, you know, <laughs> they don't do EMS runs. Um, so it was it was very focused on private dwelling fires and large private dwelling fires and, and the extrication aspect. And, you know, I caught a couple good jobs, a couple, couple serious extrications. Um, you know, they do about 1,600 runs a year. So it was, it was a good place. Um, but then an opportunity opened up in a neighboring municipality, Hartsdale, right. which had a little bit of a different response area, um, a lot more multiple dwellings, you know, six-story H-types, some nine-story class ones, things like that. Had a little bit of a bigger footprint in the mutual aid uh, game where they were going a few more places, had some more promotional opportunities, things like that. So I put in my transfer paper for there and I was lucky enough to get the spot and uh, you know I love Scarsdale I still miss the guys it was a great place but just at the time and Scarsdale's done a lot of things now where you know they're right there with Hartsdale you know but uh, at the time it was it was a good move and I kind of I kind of did it at 23 years old yeah many years (laughs) ago I mean that was the time to do it right yeah so that's cool so I mean transferred over and uh and then Hartsdale fire department so what give me the rundown on Hartsdale type of department you know staffing apparatus etc okay yeah Hartsdale is a small we used to be a combination department we really don't have any active volunteers anymore we have 37 members we run two firehouses two engines a truck and a chief it's like you know, two and one in a chief. It's a real basic one on one, you know, one on one firefighting. Um, we're in the town of Greenberg, which is kind of interesting. Uh, we have 
Fairview Fire District to the north and Greenville to the south, and we're all in the same union. We're in local uh, 1586, okay. about 110 of us in the union. We go automatic aid pretty seamlessly to each other's jobs, um, and now we go to Scarsdale automatic aid, so I see my old, my old buddies. But um, we do about 2,400 runs a year. We do EMS. Um, like I say, our response area, a lot of multiple dwellings, uh, a lot of garden apartment complexes, and then your average, you know, frames. We have Central Avenue, which runs from the, basically the Bronx line to White Plains, runs right through our response area. Okay. So we have White Plains to the north and then Yonkers to the south. Um, so it's a great place. Uh, really, we have a lot of guys really, really into the job. A lot of guys came from the volunteers. A lot of guys are instructors. We got a lot of, you know, the dreaded buffs, you know, in our job. But it's a fun place. Guys are into it. They're engaged. They love to drill. They turn out quick. Um, it's where does that come from? I think we has it always been. Big, You've been there quite a long time now. Yeah, twenty years. Uh, it ebbs you know, and flows, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it was it was a real senior job when I got there, um, as were most of the jobs. And then we had a big turnover. And I think a lot of the the younger old guys now, as you know, I guess we could call us, um, we made a commitment to like, hey, we want to create a culture here where we're going to drill, we're going to enjoy it, we're going to have the scanner on, we're going to be listening for that mutual aid fire next yeah. door and looking up the address. And it, we've been lucky with the hiring that we've hired really all great guys. And uh, it just keeps going. It keeps turning and, and getting better. And just super proud to be there. Heart, proud to be a Hartstell fireman. <laughs> the fact that you called you see that's what i love man that's that culture when you call yourself you're the deputy chief and you call yourself a hard fireman like oh, that I'm a firefighter yeah see i love that <laughs> you know how many yeah. guys forget that as they as they go up in rank i mean i've seen guys step over lines that needed to be helped pulled you know and then you watch other chiefs i had a chief send me a picture the other day of him up a stairwell pushing that line ahead because they weren't making progress like those are important things and i think that's when you have leadership that promotes that type of mentality that culture that wants that culture that wants to throw gas on that, you know, fire. That's where, yeah. that's where, I mean, people want to be there. Well, I mean, you have an opportunity when you come on the job, in my opinion, and it can be a job or it can be a profession. That's your choice, right? Now, career volunteer, you can, you can make that decision. And I, I think you're depriving yourself if you don't make it a profession, right? Who wants just a job, right? I want something that's going to engage me physically, mentally, emotionally, right? You know, the whole thing. I want, And that's what the fire service, when you really commit to it, that's what it does. And, and I think we have that opportunity. So we're, we're blessed in our uh, firehouse that, you know, we have guys that are committed to that and we want to keep it going and, and get better every day. Yeah, and I think the other thing, yeah, and, and to piggyback on that, though, we need to work hard to protect that. It, it's hard. You know, it. You come to work and you're, you're, you know, you're drilling and you're, you know, everything else, and you're going on routine responses or you might have a slow tour or something like that, and it's difficult to maintain that edge, right? Because right. you're telling everybody, okay, get ready for this fire on the ninth floor tomorrow, and when it doesn't happen today and tomorrow and in six months, at some point it's tough to keep that buy-in where people are like, well, wait a minute, is this ever going to happen or are we right. just spinning our wheels here? You know? Right. And I think that one thing that, not to go off on a tangent, but one thing that the fire department, I think, needs to do better is when we get new guys and girls into the fire department, we're telling them, hey, listen, stick around 10 years, 15 years, you're going to get experience, you're going to learn. And the reality is fire duty's down in most places, even in the busy uh, city departments. So I think we almost see like a paradigm shift of like, hey, listen, let's stick around. You're going to get some experience, but let's focus on our skills. Let's feel good when we leave. Like, so if we leave the firehouse and listen, we didn't go to a fire. You know, I was lucky. I went to a fire yesterday. Awesome, right? You know, but if we don't, feel good that you learned something today, that you enhanced your skill set. And I think we have to start to instill pride in the skill set and in learning the trade and not be as tied into the uh, experience thing. You know, experience learning, absolutely 100% the best. But you have people join the fire department right now. If you go to a place that's not one of these top 1% busy places, you can go decent periods of time without going to work. So what's the answer there? You know, oh, well, guess you're uh, not going to be a good firefighter. Yeah. You know? So that's not the answer, right? So the answer has to be, okay, we're going to now focus on our skills. So when that time comes, we're going to answer the call correctly, and then we're going to come back and be honest to what we did right and did wrong and get better. So that's kind of how I look at L it. Literally. At the skills, not the experience. Literally you know? just had this conversation last night. We had a basement fire last night. It was nice. We had a couple uh, new kids that haven't been to a fire yet. Uh, they're still in the academy. They're going through the academy, but they were on the rig with us. Um, and at the end of it, I looked at the one kid, put my hand on his shoulder, and I said, see, we catch fire every once in a while. And, yeah, you know, yeah. and it's that conversation. And I don't care if you're in small town or big city. 
not everybody's going to work all the time. And I agree with you 100% is we have to talk about the job. We have to talk about firefighting as more than just going to fires. And we have to be content um, with the job that's being performed, whether it's a routine box that, that is being reset, you know, a, an alarm that it, right. it turns out to be smoke from cooking and reset. But did you proficiently and professionally do that job to your best of your ability? Because all that matters. And I think yeah. focusing on the skills, I, I, I agree with you a hundred percent, man. I think that's a great, great way to look at it. You know, I, I think every run we go on is an opportunity yeah. to refine our skill set, right? We're going to position the same way. We're going to wear our gear the same way. We're going to be prepared to stretch a line. Um, you know, we have a rule of thumb on my group, you know, see smoke stretch. So that means, hey, you know, we might know what's an oil burner. I might pull up and be like, hey, you know, I'm 99% sure this is something, uh, uh, basically a, a routine emergency. But you know what? Let's put it, let's stretch a dry line. Let's hook up to a hydrant. And those kind of muscle memory activities, that's going to that. yield a lot of dividends at 2 o'clock in the morning when it's out the window. Chief, yeah. I love Sea Smoke Stretch. That's the name of this. That's the name of this yeah. episode. That is, <laughs> that is fantastic. But I agree, yeah. I agree with you. What a, what a great opportunity to put hose on the street. You yeah. know, you look at some of these departments, um, they're so proactive and so aggressive that any reported fire, even before they get any type of size up, they're stretching on the dwelling, right? And you look at that and you're like, man, it, you know, what a commitment. And, and you know that those guys are going to be proficient when it matters, right? When they actually yeah. do have fire showing. And I don't know if every department can do that. Only there's several reasons, but, you know, you can. Sure. Time constraints. hundred Manpower, running. Without yeah, down. back to backs, all that stuff, right? You got to pick your spots. That's right. Thank you. And and I, I agree with that. And um, But, man, see smoke stretch. I love that. Yeah. I mean, it's just, you know. I think when you get out of city departments and city departments to me are like specialists, you know, like if you had a medical issue, God forbid, or something, you're going to go into the city and see a surgeon and they're the top in the world. And they're very good at that very specific thing. I think if you're a suburban firefighter, you're like the hometown local doctor. Like you don't have a ton of experience in any one thing, but the, you know, your community expects you to at least be able to get the ball rolling in the right direction. And I think that we have to be more generalists, you know, in the, in the suburban side. So we got to look for those opportunities to, to get experience any way we can to stretch in a real building. You know, if you, you have multiple dwellings, my opinion, you know, make relationships with the supers. You should be out there stretching those buildings to see, okay, here, the hose gets caught on this newel post right here. Or, hey, you know what? If I can well hole stretch here, it cuts off two minutes off our stretch. Right. That needs to happen, you know, and a lot of times it doesn't because there's so many things we're trying to learn because we're this small town doctor. We need to know all these different things and we lose the core mission sometimes. But the I core agree with you. put mortar on fire. I couldn't agree with you more. I think we do lose the core mission at times, um, and I think it's a lot of that checkbox nonsense. But from your position as a deputy chief, I mean, checkboxes are important to you. And I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean that in no. it's, it's a, it's a uh, fact of life that we have certain things that we have to do. We have to do bloodborne pathogens. We have to do all this minutia nonsense that we – uh, the rank and file think, you know, this is crazy. We do this every year. It ties up time, opportunities. We could be doing something else and so on. And it bogs us down sometimes. Yeah, I think when you look at training, you know, and I'm the train officer for our department and I'm, you know, I, I love being an instructor. I think you have to train for the, the possible and for the probable, right? So everybody has to get at least some type of training in the, in the possible. And then if we have extra time, we're going to drill a little heavier on the probable, right? To be good on those things that... We're, we're expecting to encounter. Um, so, you know, but, you know, you talk about bloodborne pathogen training. Like, you also have to find ways to make that training interesting and to make it engaging. So, yep. like, what I do, a drill for that is I have guys pass around an orange. I cover it in ketchup. They pass it around with gloves. <laughs> and then they have to take the gloves off, right? And invariably, somebody gets ketchup. So that person then has to write an exposure report, and you do the whole thing. And that's, at least it makes it real because it's like, hey, listen, man, you just finished the EMS calls 3 o'clock in the morning. You made a mistake. You got some blood on you. What's the next step? And I think if we try to make those drills a little more real, uh, you get the buy-in. But I believe if you have extra time in your drill schedule, you should be focusing a little bit more on the probable, not the possible. I'm quiet because I'm writing that down. I love that. Ketchup on an orange. That's I what I no, but I mean that's the creativity that we need, but that takes work. And it takes yeah. somebody to look at something as stupid or, or no, I'm sorry, not as stupid, as boring no, as guys, bloodborne you know pathogen. They don't want to do it. You know? That's right. Yeah, it's boring. They don't yeah. want it. So you have to find a way like, hey, listen, this is relevant and, and we have to make it work. But 
I mean, if we're going to focus a lot, you know, I, I have an Instagram page that I'm just started doing like little drills and stuff. And I call it FD standard ops. And, you know, cause that, we have a lot of people into special ops and that's great. I got friends who are in the, you know, in sock in the city and, and, and guys who have, and girls who are very into the special ops aspects, but I'm very into the standard operations. You know, how good are we at stretching a line? How good are we at sizing a stretch? How quickly can you put your mask on? You know, and these are all the little areas where, you know, you think back at fires that you've gone to or fires I've gone to, that's where the problems happen. Yeah. You know, that's where they happen. They happen in the basics. And, uh, that's where I really like to drill a lot and try to come up with new ways to engage people with those basic drills where they're like, you know what? I know that already. Well, let's try something different. Let's put a different spin on it and see if we can get you interested again, you know, in the basics. I, I love that. I love the fact that we're focusing on the bread and butter, right? I mean, yeah. you find whether volunteer or career, it doesn't matter. We're being, we're being put in charge of anything and everything coming our way. Absolutely. And, and so now we have to diversify. And when we diversify and we try to take the same people but give them 15 different disciplines to learn, things are going to suffer. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, and it's uh, – but at the end of the day, and, and you know, one thing that I, I know we have in hearts, though, that we believe very strongly is we have a commitment to be able to put a hose line in every building in our response area. Mm. And I tell people when I say that, think about that for a second. You, know, you talk to some people and you look at the big high school or the one or two multiple dwellings they have or, you know, commercial, something like that. And you say, hey, fire on the second floor. They can get a line up there. And they're like, I don't know, man, that'll be messed up. It's like, well, what's your plan? <laughs> well, I don't know. That's probably a problem, right? And I think the public at the base, if you gave them a survey and said, hey, what do you expect out of the fire department? I got to think number one or two on the list has to be, put well, if I have a fire, they'll be able to put a hose line in the building. Yeah. So have a plan for that. Let's start there. Let's have a commitment to get a hose line in operation in every room in your response area. And I think that's a great starting point. I, I couldn't agree with you more. And it just takes, it takes consistency. It takes work. Yeah. You got to put the work in. And the only way you get people to put that work in is if they have buy-in. And the buy-in has to come from the top down and the bottom up. And, um, you know, for you being at the top, I mean, Deputy Chief's pretty high up that chain. Um, yeah. It's got to it's gotta filter down, though. There has to be departmental buy-in to their people. And I think that's one of the biggest issues we're facing right now is there's a lot of departments that expect everything from their people, but they don't bend over backwards for their people. And so, you know, there's a there's a disconnect in that relationship. It's a lot of take and not a lot of give. Yeah, I mean, I think the fire department, you know, a lot of times we focus on when things don't go well. You know, we do mm. an after action report when things don't go well and we focus a lot on that. And, and we should, you know, I think that. I think ego is one of the worst things in the fire department. You know, me and my buddy uh, always talk about that. Ego is one of the worst things. So if we look at ourselves critically, it brings humility, which I think makes us better. That being said, we shouldn't be afraid to tell people good job. Right. Hey, man, awesome job there. Nice spot in that rig. You know, if, if and even on these, these, these food on the stoves or something, hey, you know what? If we had a fire right now, we'd be ready to go. And just giving that positive reinforcement of, of Hey, we're ready to go. We're, we have pride in our unit. Other people respect us when we come in. They say, you know what? Hearts does going to get a line if they show up. They're going to commit and do their task. And be proud of that. Be proud of the patch in your arm. You know, I, I remember the first time getting my class A. I remember the first time getting my turnout coat with my name on it. Those were proud moments. But you got to keep earning that. You have to keep earning that patch in your arm. You know, earn that name on your coat. And uh, that's you, every day. You made me think of something. Uh, I just had this conversation the other day that um, – I was leaving my firehouse and I said, guys, keep talking about firefighting. They're talking about football. They're talking about all these different things. And I'm sitting there and I'm like, guys, we haven't, we're in a firehouse. We're firemen. Like what, can we talk about some fire stuff here? Yeah, like, you know, fun. and I, listen, I get it. It can't be all the time. We can't, you know, we have to have different avenues of escape from it. But I also think that we need to have conversations when you, you know, you look down the table and you look at who's sitting there and the younger guys are going to take the lead from the older guys. And if the conversation doesn't come around the firefighting, then the conversation doesn't get the firefighting sometimes. And uh, I, think, I think to create that culture and to maintain that culture, you have to constantly be engaged to talk about it. And so those food on the stove calls where that second due engine didn't position correctly or they didn't sit on the plug or the, the engine backdoored the truck and we couldn't get ground ladders out the rear, but that's okay, it's food on the stove. Those things all matter, and we need to have those conversations, though. Oh, yeah. And we need to talk about firefighting. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, firefighting, I think the strength of the fire department is we come from diverse backgrounds, right? So 
you know, last week we had a, uh, an, an industrial accident with somebody with their hand stuck in a sander and the guys did phenomenal. And, uh, you know, amputation and now they, they reattached the hand. I mean, it was, it was such a success story yeah, and I was nice. so proud of watching them work, you know. Yeah. But the beauty of that was everybody had different backgrounds. One guy was a diesel mechanic. One guy's like, hey, I have a plow route. I use this thing. So the diversity is great when we have those type of calls. But we also have to remember that what binds us together is the fire department. So to keep pivoting back to love what it. binds us together. Like love I it. love when you have a different skill set and you can bring it to the table. That's awesome. I want to hear about it. I want to learn it. But I think my job as a, you know, I'm a tour, I'm a shift commander, tour commander. You know, I have a group. My job is to pivot the conversation back to the fire department all the time. And I think that's my role as a senior guy and as, as an officer. So, you know, we'll talk about all those things. But then, you know, news comes on, Channel 2 News or something comes on. Hey, look at this fire out in Jersey or yes. something like that. Hey, what would we do if we had this right here, guys? Hey, what does that building look like? That looks like what address here? Hey, where's the closest hydrant? And we just that's our job from there. We have, yeah. we have an obligation to do that, right? Yeah. And, and, and it's okay to love it, you know, like – Guys will sit there and talk about sports or whatever else. And I love, I, I'm a Ranger fan. I love sports. But don't be afraid to be into the job and have those conversations like we would talk about sports. You know, people talk for an hour about, you know, did you see that play last night? I would have done this. They should have called that. Right, this right, audible, right. right? Okay. Well, let's talk about that in terms of firefighting. You know, let's talk about that and say, okay, what happens when we do a forward lay and that hydrant's frozen? Right. Ooh, wow. I don't know. Wow. How do we fix that? Who's going to fix that? You know, and these are important things that happen, you know. So, and those are the kind, I think, the best kind of drills is when you just go out on a run and you say, okay, now we pull up and it's out the windows in that kitchen. They forward laid, hydrant's frozen, go. Yep. And now everybody sits there. Ooh. Yeah. But then you watch. Everybody starts problem solving. Hey, you know what? I'd have third do engine back into the block, lay out to the next hydrant. Okay, you know, and all these things start happening. And that's why I think they're really the good stuff. Because we learn from each other. Even, the, you know, and that's where we engage the junior guys, right? Because they may have a great idea that they're scared to bring out or may not even have the platform to bring out now if you start working it around the table and you're like hey man what do you think and he's like well i was thinking about this hey great job and then tell him great job and you know i never understood when somebody's new in the fire department right you know like and i get it the <laughs> the old school stuff we used to get bucketed and all this nonsense sure. right and i get that there has to be some of that where you have to earn your place and you have to understand your role but i never understood how when you're joining the fire department we should be bringing you in right we want you to be part of the team we're called brothers like sisters right it's about love it's about trust and then when you come in, we kind of shun you. Like yep. after, you know, the kitchen's done, hey, Proby, go get in the sink. Hey, You're going to earn your keep get... here. <laughs> and I get it if that is warranted for the situation. But if you have people that are just coming in, let's just be nice to them. Let's talk to them. Let's engage them. Hey, what do you think about this? You know, and I think that really pushes that culture forward. It gets buy-in and it gets people to realize we're, you know, all together. I couldn't, I couldn't agree with you more. And in fact, I, I talked about this in my program. I had, I was talking about um, trust and I said, you know, yeah. Let's give these kids let's give these kids respect and trust as soon as they come through the door and let them lose it. Don't make them earn it. Let them lose it. And I had a guy in the crowd's like, "Well, I don't I don't necessarily agree with that, you know, because of this and that." And I said, "Great." I said, "But all you have to do, it's no different than what you're thinking." I said, "It's just changing your mindset." Right. I said, "Don't make them work for it. Don't dangle something in front of them to work for it." I said, "Give it to them and let them lose it." I said, and then when they lose it, you can then treat them accordingly or you bring them back up to where they need to be. But I go, why do we have to penalize people? These people, we need to embrace them. We need to bring them in. They need to follow what we expect from them, right? But yeah. let's give them the opportunity to perform and be the very best they can. Nobody can be the best they can if they're constantly looking over their shoulder or afraid to make a decision. Exactly. You know, I, and I think we also have to remember – being probies ourselves right remember how you felt when you started you know i was so focused on trying to get the respect of the senior firefighters and trying to get the approval of them uh get their level of trust you know in, in me and you want to be able to give them those opportunities to have it if you close that off you know they're not going to join the team it's not going to happen it just makes the process so much harder and in and, and this day yeah. and age where we want where we complain all the time about people but what are we doing? It, right? Yeah, I mean, but what are we we'll doing? What are we doing to capture them? What are we doing to keep them? What are we doing to get their buy-in? I mean, it takes yeah. as much work from us as it does for them to find their career in this. Yeah, I mean, and I think going back to the drill and, and, and create opportunities for firefighters to be firefighters. 
right? yeah. to feel like you're a firefighter, yeah. stretch a line, to pack hose together. You know, the time packing hose in the back step of a rig, that's a great time. That's it's bonding. That's the good stuff. That's priceless. the stuff we're going to remember. That's priceless. what we're going to miss yeah. when we're done. Yep. You know, so create that for them and, and, and bring them in, you know, and I, those little lessons that you teach them at the kitchen table or after drill or after a job, that's what they'll remember their whole lives. And I try to tell the senior, uh, more senior guys in our job now that too. I'm like, they're going to remember what you're saying right now for the rest of your lives. I remember what my senior firefighters told me as a one, two, three year person. I remember, you know, teaching, I fortunate enough to teach our probie school and uh, I've done that for a long time. And they, I've had guys that I've, and girls who I've taught come back and be like, hey, I, rem I was at a fire and I remember what you said and we yeah. did this. Yeah. Think about that responsibility. Yeah. That they're going to remember that for the rest of their lives. So we should act accordingly. We have such an opportunity to influence them positively, you know. Well, I couldn't agree with you more. And, and I want to kind of transition just a little bit. So in Westchester, where you are with Hartsdale, we alluded to it before. There's a lot of smaller cities, smaller departments around, a lot of career departments. So I got to assume there's a lot of automatic aid that's yes. happening there, right? So if you guys have, what, two engines, two trucks? Is that what you said? Two engine, one truck. Two and one. Okay. Yeah. There's so you only got... seven to nine on duty, so the staffing's very light. So for a structural fire, whether it's a room and contents or the whole second floor off, you're going to be using more than two and one. Without a doubt. So that's where the automatic aid comes yeah. in. Um, Greenberg, where, where I am now, we were kind of like I think was some of the first, if not the first, to start the automatic aid concept. But, you know, it used to be you get there, okay, we got a fire. We used to call it a fire. Then we called it a 1075. Right. You know, so now you give the 1075, and now the units come, right? So now what we've started doing is starting those units out on the report of a fire. Yes. Just to cut down on that reflex time, right? And now we're drilling together more. We're using the same radio frequency now. We're, and it's just every year it seems to get a little bit better, a little bit better. Um, so now, like, if I get a report of a fire, I immediately get an engine and a truck to the scene, automatic aid from the surrounding departments, and right. I get one unit to relocate. So, And then if I get the 1075, that unit comes up to the scene, right? So... I'll still get 15 to 17, try to get with that NFPA 1710 uh, compliance. And then obviously second alarm and third alarm, it gets bigger and bigger. But the bigger thing that I think is different with a, a suburban department than a city department is our units are further and further away. Yes. So like the, the recognition of like, okay, I might need a second alarm here. If you don't make that sooner They're traveling. Later, it's a while. For, yeah. you know, I got, you know, second alarm companies are coming out of the city of Yonkers for us. That's a ride. You know, that's going to take a little while for them to get there. So you got to be ahead of the curve in rec recognizing those those issues, um, which I think we have to think about. And also thinking about, you know, there's that second alarm where you pull up and you're like, okay, it's definitely multiple alarm. <laughs> yeah, it's right? a sure thing. No doubt. Thing. Everybody knows this, right. right? But there's, I think, more where you get that basement fire in a balloon frame and you need people on three floors opening up and it's 95 degrees outside. Well, guess what? That might be a third alarm. Yep. Because that fire ground is going to run out of gas at some point, you know? And so it's just, it's interesting. It's challenging from that perspective. Why has, it, why has it changed over the years? I'm just curious. I mean, it's modern. It's, it's, it's a more modern way of thinking. It's understanding resource, you know, uh, you know, utilizing your resources better and so on. But like I find today the home turf thing is not really a thing anymore. And I'm, I'm grateful for that. I think that's one of, if I have to look back, I mean, we, you know, we came in the fire service, I think in similar eras, you know what yeah. I mean? And, I think that's one of the best things I've seen change in my time in the fire department mm -hmm. is, is you're not that, you know, okay, this is us, this is you. It's more of a collaborative effort. Like we all recognize, and I think it goes back to that humility, right? Like it used to be based in like, hey, we're going to put out our own fires. And now it's like, it's okay to ask for help. That's right. No problem, man. And you yeah. know what? When we do that, we all get to go to more work anyway. So it's a great that's thing. We all some, like it. It yeah, works. The upside, you know? right? Everybody so, likes yes. going to fires. Who doesn't, right? Yeah. So I, I think there's an aspect of, that and I also think there's just a greater awareness to safety of just like hey you know what even since we came on right I started in three quarter boots in the volunteers yeah right? I'm sure you did too right uh and yep now, yep now we, we keep going we're at 45 minute cylinders PSS units all these different things and you know I'm not you know the same uh, body type that I was the day that I came in the fire department <laughs> right and I'm 25 years old or whatever so now we're asking people to do stuff where more equipment older we have to be cognizant of that we you know and it's kind of a sobering thing to think about, but I do believe it. I'm not trying to, you know, be too dramatic with this. But, like, if you give a firefighter the opportunity, he or she will work themselves to death, if you think about it. Yeah. Right? If you, Every firefighter I've ever asked who I can tell is beat up and shot, they're like, oh, you know, pulling ceilings, it's 95 degrees. Like, hey, man, you good? What do you think they're going to say? Yeah. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. They'll never say they're not good. Right? So it's whose responsibility is that? 
that's the chief officers, that's the line officers that have to be like, hey, they're the accelerator, we're the brake. Hey, you know what? You've done a good job, you gotta go to rehab. And I think that's where that awareness started to come in, where it's like, we have that responsibility to our people to have that resources there so we don't have to make them do two or three bottles because it's not even safe. Yeah. You know, think about times, and I'm sure you've done it. I've done three bottles. I'm mm-hmm. sure you've done three bottles. Mm-hmm. Is you at three bottles the same Jeremy that's at one bottle? Right. No way. Yeah. You're they, a different firefighter. Correct. You're not as effective. Right. So we're trying to, I think that's awareness came out of like, hey, listen, and it's okay. And now we get fresh troops who come in. And they can come in on that first bottle mentality, and they're ready to really do the job and do it safely. So I think just, you know, those different reasons we said, all right, let's start bringing these units in a lot sooner. Uh, It all makes sense. And I'm so glad because I'm seeing it where we are, too. And, in fact, what I really love about the system we're putting together here, it's almost becoming a countywide system without an organized countywide system. And we're doing it ourselves Um, I'd love to see more formulation of, you know, more formal approach to it down the road, but we're getting there. Um, Progress. We are behind the eight ball for sure, but it's understanding and allocating the correct resources and knowing that on a structural fire, we need four engines and two trucks with a special service and we need to provide a fast team. And in fact, on these large square footage homes, we might be bringing in two fast teams, you know, because we have some large square footage here, you know? So those are things that I think are important in, in, I love leadership today that recognizes that. And, and I think that the sooner we can get more resources, the availability of more people and equipment to, to I, I think ultimately we'll have a better outcome, a safer Absolutely. outcome too. Absolutely. And, and one thing that we've been lucky to do on the career side in Westchester too, kind of reverse engineering, you know, we have to do sometimes in the fire department, is all the train officers got together, so, municipal train owners, MTOs, and we have a group. We meet once a month. Yep. And we set up joint training of all the career departments. So we'll do like skill drills in the spring and the fall. And, you know, like in the spring, we do truck stuff. In the, in the uh, fall, we do engine work. And then we, it culminates with we'll do like an, um, a multiple alarm drill. You know, we'll do that. We'll come we'll do live fire with all different companies. And that's our time to put it all together to check and make sure, you know, do our, our threads all match up? Do, can we do our radio frequencies match up? Is channel seven in your radio, channel seven in my radio? Yeah. You know, like things like that. Sure. And I think that's where we've gotten a lot of the success with it is the train officers getting together and then trying to create these these opportunities for everybody to come together. Because you're not going to have success in automatic aid if I don't know your first name. Right. If you pull up and I, we don't know each other, we're not going to have that level of success. you got to be able to pull up and say, hey, Bill, what's up, man? What do you need? And I'll say, all right, dude, you know what, man? Can you get around, get a line to the second floor? Great. If I don't know you, there's almost like a vetting process that has to occur in front of Absolutely. that building. Absolutely. Which, like, who is this guy? Yep. And then do your members know, hey, if I send you up as the chief officer to take over the third floor, okay, he's Division Three, and now one of my firefighters is up there, and he's like, who's this dude giving me orders? Right. You know, should he be? Should yep. I be listening to yep. him? Yep. So that all has to get worked out ahead of time, and that's the automatic aid. That's the background work on automatic aid to make it successful. I uh, agreed. Agreed. And I, I think that it's awesome that you guys are doing that. Plus, what I think is fun, too, then, is, you know, you guys are proud in Hartsdale to be able to get a line into any building and, and you know, quickly and effic- you know, efficiently and effectively get a line in any building within your first two. That has to spill over to those other departments, then, that are coming to you and you're going there. And that's what I love when it becomes infectious, right, where the culture of one department that's aggressive and, you know, full steam ahead can, like, spill over to the departments around them to want to be better and to pick up their game. And I think that's important, especially when you're running automatics with them. Yeah, I mean, we're we're fortunate. that Our our mutual aid companies, you know, I'm very proud of Westchester County Fire Departments. You know, I'm very proud of the career departments that we run in with. They're all committed uh, we, we're starting to set up our hose beds the same. We're starting, yeah. you know, we're starting to get some similar type operations, like you said, which is a byproduct yep. of running in together. But um, you know, I, I think these drills that we have it, it creates a place where we can all talk, right? And and come up with like what's the priorities. And I think the smaller you get in departments, the more important the first hose line is, right? So like if you're a city department, like some of our friends in the city departments in, in Yonkers, the bigger places, they can kind of operate in parallel where the truck is searching while the engine's stretching. In the smaller places, we have to operate in series, right? It's like, hey, man, either we're making a search right away yeah. or we're stretching a line. Yep. And having those conversations, that allows us to get more on the same page when we show up. Now we can show up and I can say, hey, I know their priority is getting the first line. I'm looking for a water source, and then we're thinking about making some searches for them. Then we're thinking about ventilation. You know, It goes from the city-style position-oriented to the suburban-style task-oriented. Well, that's it. And I think that lets us – you know, and those are two different styles of firefighting. 
two very different styles, you know, um, for sure. And I think that's where and you in training, and this is where I wanted to kind of segue into, you're doing a great job at segueing for me. Thank you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but on the training side, right? Like realistic training approaches, realistic into what your, what your operational situational every day is, and then train towards that. Because there's nothing worse. Like I can I can speak to like volunteers where it's a training night and they get, you know, a six man engine company and they're stretching with a six man engine company. It's not reality 100%. when you got three men typically, you know, stretching on a fire. So we need to we need to train to our operational reality for sure. They're very well put, you know, and, and that's what we're trying to do even in probie school now. You know, where it used to be, hey, you know, we're gonna give you a squad to do this and a squad maybe six people or something like that. And we're like, you know what? Let's <laughs> up the evolutions and yeah. do two evolutions of three and three. Yeah. Because the other thing that's important too is when you're doing those evolutions with the right amount of the, – the real realistic amount of staffing. I shouldn't say the right amount. It's not the right amount. Um, is it allows even, like, people, chief officers, command, incident commanders, line officers to realize, like, we all read all these great books, you know, the great texts, you know, Norman and Turpac and Navillo, and that's the foundational, you know, works in our fire service. That being said, it's a lot different on a promotional exam saying, okay, I got fire extension. Okay, right. Put a line here, put a line there. Well, in the textbook, when you have all the staff people, yeah, that happens. And sure. on an emotional exam, that happens the way it's supposed to happen. That's right. Let's actually see the time it takes now to do it with our actual staffing. Yeah. And if we don't drill that way, the chiefs aren't going to know that there's a significant delay when we don't have enough people on the fire ground. And then how do we, how do we make those adjustments tactically? Um, so I think that having that realistic training, it doesn't just help the firefighters. It helps everybody. It helps everybody make a better understanding of what that fire ground is really, what's reasonable and achievable. You know, with our staff, you make a very good point, right? From a from a tactical side, uh, from the command staff, from a operations chief to the command chief, making the decisions and then giving the time to allow those decisions to take hold. That's where you find experience in leadership. That's where you find experience, um, uh, well experienced guys that have street smarts, guys that have the experience in that have put hose in the streets, that have been in those decision-making situ- you know, uh, positions, they have to allow time for decisions and, and to happen. And I know I'm fumbling over how I wanted to word this because I'm trying to word it correctly. You but I think you, you hit on a very good point, and I think we lose track of that. And I think where, where we don't have a, a tremendous amount of confidence, if you will, or experience in decision-making, that's where decisions are being made too late. And then we can't effectively, the rank and file, the backstep firefighters can't get those tasks done in a time in a timely fashion because the command or the idea of it was offered too late. And command doesn't give them enough time to make it happen. Yeah, I, I think, and even the concept of like having that timetable for, okay, if I know I have a three-member engine stretch into the fourth floor of a four-story class three, okay, if I drill a lot there, I have a ballpark, okay, it takes about four minutes yes. on a good day in drill, right? Okay, so I know I have to give them at least that, right? Right, Maybe four or five minutes. And now I'm going to watch fire conditions, see what's going on. But if I keep asking them after two minutes, what's your status? Well, if they're answering me on the radio, you know what they're not doing? They're, yeah, they're not stretching. So, yeah. so, so, right. So, and then the other aspect of if it's not happening now, it's at five or six minutes, you know what? I have to start funneling resources to that line. So maybe some of the other stuff that it, I want it to happen has to get delayed now. Because I got to reinforce that position, and 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 that's a difference again of a small department versus maybe a large department. We start, you know, using other teaming up other companies. I may have to take a truck company. Hey, man, they're having problems getting that line up there. I need you to give a hand lighting up on that line, and having that awareness in the drill, in, in the tabletops that we do and we talk of like, hey, you may come in on a truck, but if that hose line's not in position. You may have to help out with that initially. Yeah, okay. it also it also goes with the guy that's not tired hooking on his third bottle, right? And he's not going to tell you he's tired. So if they're having struggles with that line, they're going to get on the radio and say to the say to the chief, they're going to say, "We're working on it, chief, making progress." Yep, exactly. But meanwhile, they're tripping over all the shit in the hallway. They're having a hard time stretching, and so on. And 100%. so that's where the experience matters in allocating resources. And the one that allocates the resources is the guy with the radio in in the, in the white hat. Yeah, yeah. I mean. One thing that we did recently is, is, is we have acting deputy chiefs. The captains will act up occasionally. It's, it doesn't happen too often. Um, but uh, well, my chief said, you know, I want to get a, a program together to train them before they do it. You know, so I came up with like a two-day program in-house, and we did it. 
And then we've been trying to offer it at the county a couple of times, just as some officer development type stuff, which I think we need to give more of. Right. You know, I think we have to do a lot of firefighter skill development. I think officer development, annual officer development, very important. But one thing that we do is I have them ride the car for a day and I kind of mentor them and I stay there. And a couple of times we had little things here and there. And I said, you know, like look over at the, the captain, I'd say, taking a lot longer than you wanted to, right? And he's like, yeah, this feels like forever. Yeah. And I'm like, well, now remember that when you're inside, right? Give me the updates when you think you need help. And, right. and I think we, we have to do a better job of teaching our different positions. You know, firefighters do tasks, line officers do tactics, chiefs do strategy. Mm. But sometimes we operate in a vacuum, right? Where it's like, well, don't worry about what the chief's doing. I know what I'm doing, kid. You know, when I tell you to stretch, just stretch. But we got to start teaching the why. Well, okay, this is why I want the line there. Okay, from a line officer, this is why we did the well, use the well hole. This is why I went with the rope stretch. This is why we, right? And getting in more into that because that helps everybody get better. And I think sometimes with the line officers, we're not showing them from the chief officer rank what's going through our heads outside. And then how can we expect them to give us what we need information wise? Because when you think about it, the line officer setting the tone. Line officer says there's fire in the cockwa. Boom, we're going second, third alarm. That's not me making that decision. They made that decision for me when they gave me that transmission. So what are those critical transmissions we want to hear? Yeah. Right? What are those big, big moments? On, oh, okay, now we have to change the, 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 the tempo of the fire ground. But we got to train them that on that way, you know? So I think that's where that training comes back in. And I think a lot of that training was done on the, on the job, uh, on fire grounds over years and years of guys, you know, uh, marinating in these positions for more than a year or two. Right when you when you when you have a, a you know a senior captain of a truck company, he's got several years as a company boss, several years of going to top floor fires, so he can give that report. That's where experience matters. When we're when we're lacking in the in the practical experience, we need to give them then every single tool outside of the hands on experience to at least help guide make that decision and educate them what call they need to make and when they need to make it. Absolutely. And, you know, I think we have to do a better job, too, of being, uh, of sharing more with our experiences. You know, mm. like, I think it, it, when I first came on the job, sometimes some of the, you know, the, the officers, and they were good, but it's just a different mentality. Their kind of thing was like, well, you know, I know what I know, and my job is here to, and I'll tell you what you need to know when you need to know it. You right. Know? And the problem is, is that when that officer retires or leaves the fire service, you know, that information goes with them. With them. Yeah. So to me, like, it's no good if only I know it. I right. have to share it with you. But with that, you give up some of your power, right, in the firehouse. Like, if I know the answers to some of the stuff and maybe you don't know it, well, now you need me. You know, so it involves that humility and that, that commitment to working together, man. We're all in this together, you know, and, and helping out. And I, and I think that that's something we really have to push more. You keep that information to yourself. You're not doing us any good and you're not doing a job any good. Nope. You got you, you to leave it behind. Um, and you're still the go-to guy. But you can certainly share your knowledge and experience. We need you to, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more. On the training side, um, a lot of this, what we're talking about is actual experience and, and so on versus, you know, uh, alternative ways of gaining knowledge and experience these days. Mm-hmm. Um, and so our jobs are trending younger. Officers, you know, line officers, company bosses are trending younger and so on. So it sounds like, though, in Hartsdale and yourself, with, with your commitment to, to the companies and your department, you put together a program that embraces that and, and allows them and gives them every tool to succeed. I mean, that matters, man. They need to, yeah. they need to feel that from the top. I mean, we're, we're, we're trying. You know, I mean, we're, we're a team. And it's not, you know, group four versus group one or two. Right. You know, it's, we're a team. Right. And, and it's not one department versus another department. So I think trying to set the table for people and giving them those skills where they can succeed is it's our that's our responsibility. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm not going to be on the job forever. And I want to be able to leave something where we keep moving in the right direction long after I'm gone. And I think we should have that feeling of connection of like, you know what, I'm I'm a small part of this. This isn't about me. It's about us. And it's, transferring your skills to other people that's your best legacy yeah the best thing you can do yeah and there's nothing like seeing that person perform after you've had some oh. time with them it's just oh. so fulfilling and i i can't stress that enough to people it's like give give everything to everybody around you and watch it happen it's the best thing in the world absolutely and, and I, you know it's funny i was like the more time i get on now and you know i still feel like a, a junior you know proby you know junior guy 
and I'm like number two in seniority in our job. You know, <laughs> it's insane, it's scary. Um, but but the thing is, is like you know, I have almost like a fear when I'm you know sitting there at night or you know, and I'm thinking about the job and I'm you know on a night tour, and I'm like, I hope that I've told everything that I can think of yeah. that they might need to know to them yeah. before they need it. Yeah. You know, sometimes we're drilling and, and they're like, oh, all right, chief, man, you're going to keep going with this stuff. And I'm you know, I, I, I go on, you know, my, my, I have a famous 20 minute drill. They made a, sh- a shirt about it. It had 20 minutes on a digital clock, but then it had like another clock spinning because it went way past 20 minutes. Right. You know, and I'm, sometimes I get going, but it's out of fear. I don't want to have something that I, maybe I experienced or I even, one of my buddies experienced who I teach with who I, I know that, and I didn't relay it to you. And now you encountered it. And I'm going to say, oh, man, I wish I would have told him that. That's a, you know, that's a drive that I think a lot of we uh, instructors have. A lot it's not of people. About, yep. Go ahead. You know, it's about just giving to you what you need when you need it, you know, before it happens. I think when you're all in like that, a lot of people can lose some sleep over, did I do good enough? Did I pass on enough? Did I give them every little tool they need? I'm not there to help mitigate any of this, so I hope I did that in the upfront. Yeah. You know, I always joke around. I say, you know, the uh, the white helmet's a little heavier than all the other helmets. You know what I mean? Because there's a burden there, you know, and and you want to put your people in a position to succeed. And, you know, you you love the guys that you work with. You want that, you know, you know their families, you know their wives, you know their kids. And you you want them to have a safe tour and, and do well. And that's the motivation at the end of the day is just the love for each other and the trust we have in each other that you want to give them everything they need. Yeah, I love it. Chief, last thoughts, final words. Talk to me then. I mean, you have, and, and I'm not trying to shut this down. I'm just looking at time and so on. Sure. You like, you're teaching not just within your department as a training officer and the surrounding departments, but you do it on a countywide basis too. So you have volunteers coming through the academy. You have career coming through the academy and so on. So to be able to influence all those firefighters coming through with giving them the basics through the through the, uh, the not-so-basic, uh, hey, you might encounter, encounter this one day, here's a nugget for you type thing. What does that do for you? What it, what's your takeaway on that? My, my takeaway is I, just, I always go back to the 17-year-old kid that walked yeah. into the firehouse, and all I've ever wanted to be was a firefighter. You yeah. know? And to be able to recognize that in other people who are younger than me, who are newer, and keep that fire inside them going and, and, and watch them. And I, I tell you, when I have those encounters with people and they say, hey, Chief, I, I use that technique with the nozzle you showed me. I put the nozzle at 80 degrees and, and, and knock the room down. It, it's so gratifying. And, you know, it's, an, it's a way, too, like we join this job, this profession to, to help people. That's a way to help people without actually being at that fire, right? As an instructor, if you taught somebody something and they use it, you're at that fire. There's a little party that's there that's catching that job, yeah. you know? And, I think that's the best part, you know, just passing it on. Well, I think that's what happened to you. You know, we started this conversation today talking about the influence of the Bronx Firehouse up into getting into Westchester and the influence of your neighborhood firehouse. Yeah. It, yeah. You I mean, never yeah. know the impact, and I, I, I can't stress that enough, especially for guys that teach and instruct, whether it's on a real technical level down to your entry-level programs. You never know who you're going to touch or affect in their careers. And uh, it's, it could be a smile. It could be an extra 30 seconds with a student. Or it could be an extra, you know, two hours in the parking lot, you know, going on and on about something you already taught. Those moments matter. And we got to take that time, brother. We got we to gotta take that time to, to instill that into others. Yeah, absolutely. That's the good stuff when you think about it. it that's is the, the good, good memories for us and for them. That's the good stuff. That's why, that's why we love it. Chief, what a great conversation today, man. Thank you so much for joining me today, truly. Thanks a lot. I had a lot of fun. It was a good, good it was a great conversation and um, and I think so much of what you're doing there and what the departments are doing around you, your department, the the pride and culture that you guys have there, I, I think so many are are looking for that and so many have it and need to maintain it. And um, I think this conversation will certainly resonate with a ton of people. So I hope, I hope it does. I appreciate you. Deputy Chief Bill Thanks Parrott, so thank you, brother. I appreciate you Thanks for joining lot, me Jenny. today. Stay right here. I'm going to sign off the podcast. Don't don't click off yet. Just stay with me, and then uh, I'll come right back to you, okay? Sounds good. Cool, man. Hey, guys, thanks for tuning in for another episode of the National Fire Radio Podcast. Deputy Chief Bill Parrott out of the Hartsdale, New York Fire Department. What a great conversation. And do me a favor. Take this conversation, take it back to the firehouse, and talk about it because as we talk about the job, We're always making that job better. So we'll see you at the next one. Jeremy, National Fire Radio.
Fire Radio.